Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Raj Raghavansi. I'm a consultant plastic surgeon uh, with an interest in aesthetic and reconstructive surgery. I'm going to discuss aspects of treating the, a the aging face with contemporary techniques such as the chemical peel. When I assess a face, I have certain ideal, a certain benchmark in mind when I see a patient. And one of the, the, the images that I always have in mind is, is of this young, pretty girl. An aesthetic skeleton, harmonious soft tissue balance, and beautiful skin draping the face. And although we cannot always give the patient what they have wanted for, what we do is we have these ideals and these benchmarks that we aspire to. So you saw the balance on the first slide, and here is the imbalance. Now, you can see here loose skin, uh, excess fat in the lower lids. You can see here loose skin again, brow ptosis, mid-face ptosis, and again, obviously, breast ptosis as well. And all these phenomena have two or three things in common, which is that they have skin laxity and loss of soft tissue balance. This we term aging in the aesthetic uh, arena. Now, why do we age? Well, there, it's multifactorial, as we all know. There is a certain degree of intrinsic genetic predisposition where some patients do age quicker than others, and there is surely a, uh, a, an, a hereditary element to that. On, superimposed on that are the extrinsic factors, we, which we all know about, and actually this, this sort of conference is, is excellent to highlight these extrinsic factors in, in the hope of prevention. But the ones that come to mind are, uh, are diet, sun, smoking, um, and I'm sure we can read off a few more as well. But on the whole, aging is multifactorial, and at best we should try to prevent it, but if, if we can't prevent it and it's upon us, then obviously there are contemporary strategies to deal with it. So when seeing a patient who has come with an aging problem, be it the brow, be it the face, be it the eyelids, the breast. There are several things in the history that are important to ascertain. And first and foremost is a history of sun exposure. A history where the patient is uh, questioned about the exact safety mechanisms that they have put in place for their very skin in terms of sunblock, in terms of uh, sun protection. Obviously, it's important to ascertain about certain habits. Previous treatments is important because it's important to know what they've had in the past and what's worked and what hasn't worked. There is no point in reinventing the wheel and I do a detailed history of the patient's non-surgical and surgical treatments such as peels, such as uh, application of certain creams. So it's important to know that what, the, what the, the, the skin has already been treated for. Injectables, history of injectables is also important. and also what their current regime of facial care is. And you'd be surprised to know, certainly I, I practice uh, in, in central London, I think about two out of five of my patients do not actually have a proper regime for skin care of their face, which is surprising. Um, and, and also, <laughs> I put a picture up here. This is a picture I took uh, many years ago um, on a trip to Nepal. And it's an amazing picture because it actually delineates exactly where wrinkles do occur on the face. And if that is, is, is uh, if you like, a perfect example of how the wrinkles do occur on the various cosmetic units of the face. And I put this picture up because it is important to know exactly what the patient's looking for as well. It's important to know what the aspirations are, what the expectations are, because as we know, patient expectations and to meet them is probably one of the most important aspects of our field. Um, a little bit on skin microanatomy, which I'm sure you're, you're all aware of. Uh, the epidermis and then, and then the dermis. The epidermis has two layers. It has the papillary dermis. Sorry, the, the dermis has the two layers, the papillary dermis and then the reticular dermis with the intermediate reticular dermis in between. The epidermis has five layers of which the top two layers are keratinized and shed uh, every hour by all of us. So this is healthy, normal skin histology. Here is the aging skin. Now here you can see um, in contrast, the epidermis is, is, is thickened with keratin, it's plugged, um, the, the cell turnover is delayed, um, and in, in, in addition to that, the dermis is atrophied and thinner, it's got these rectae ridges, 
it's not uniform and smooth and this is because it's lost its collagen support and it's lost its elastin support as well. So it is important to, before we even think about treating the aging face, it's important to know about the normal anatomy of the skin and how this changes with aging. Um, just a, a word on, on skin thickness. Um, I, I do make a point about assessing skin in detail when I see a patient for any form of aesthetic surgery because it is important to know that there are subtle differences even between one or the other cosmetic unit. So this is the eyelid and this is a cheek, for example. These figures are micron. This is the, this is the thickness of skin. So this is the epidermis and this is the uh, papillary and, and reticular dermis. And as you can see here, the thickness varies tremendously, even just between the eyelid and the cheek. You can see how thin the eyelid skin is and how thin actually the, skin, the neck skin is as well. This is something that um, not, is not taken on board by by um, several people, is, which is that the neck skin is also very thin, epidermis and the papillary dermis, and therefore has to be treated with care and with, with attention. Um, but again, it's, it's important to, to be able to appreciate um, varying skin thickness on, on the face and the neck, and then to be able to translate your knowledge into applying that when you're assessing the patient. Um, so I, I have sort of I think about the skin in three T's. I try to make things simple and for myself, and I do texture, tone, and turga when I assess anyone's skin. And this goes for uh, whatever I do, or if I do a rhinoplasty, or if I do an abdominoplasty, or a facelift. Before any of these procedures, I, the first thing I do is, uh, well, the first thing as far as the examination is concerned, is I assess the skin with the three T's. So let's just go through this, the, the three T's. First of all, it's texture. Now, by that, I mean the thickness of skin. By that, I mean the, the, the density of pores. By that, I mean the size of the pores and their distribution. As you can see here, this lady's got thick, sebaceous skin with a high-density pores, especially in the mid-face and on the alar base here. The next thing is skin tone. By that, I mean color. Um, uh, you know, in patients who've had previous sun exposure, there is normally a uh, gradation of, of, of skin color where they are darkest in the mid face because of the forehead being protected by the hair to a certain extent, the forehead is lighter, and again they have a degree of, of um, uh, disparity of, of the tone uh, as far as the lower face and the neck is concerned. So by tone I mean pigmentation, but I also mean sort of um, light veins, uh, light, uh, like thread veins under the face, what we call spider nevi, uh, and also generalized redness. Um, I wouldn't say rosacea, that's, a bit, that's too strong a word, but I think generalized redness, uh, it's important to assess that because if the patients do have these features before treatment, then it's important to know to tailor your treatment accordingly. The third thing, of, all, of course, um, being um, involved with skin is skin turga. And skin turga is laxity. Okay? It's the degree of laxity of skin, um, and there's a certain degree of laxity which is within normal limits, but this, you know, this kind of skin laxity is within abnormal limits and therefore needs attention. With turga, I'll also mention wrinkles, rytids, um, otherwise known as, and rytids, as we all know, occur because of skin thinning over the muscles underlying them and also because of muscle hypertrophy. So it's important to appreciate, um, just like the, the slide I showed you earlier of that, of, of that uh, aged man, to, to be able to as assess exactly where the wrinkles are and to see how they are at rest and at animation. That's also the key when you're looking at wrinkles because there are certain wrinkles which are static, there are certain wrinkles which are dynamic. I'm sorry if this is um, repeat to, to some of you, but I'm just trying to sort of get the basis right before I go into uh, uh, contemporary strategies for treatment. So it's important to assess the, the wrinkles and their dynamicity with, with motion. Um, of course, uh, there, are, uh, there is a whole range of treatments you can offer these patients, and um, being an aesthetic surgeon, obviously surgical rejuvenation in the form of, I mean, this lady's had uh, an eyelid, uh, upper and lower eyelid reduction in the form of a blepharoplasty. Uh, this is uh, three months after the surgery. But of course, I'm not going to be talking about um, uh, uh, aesthetic surgery to you. I'm going to talk to you about non-surgical rejuvenation of the face. So in terms of non-surgical rejuvenation, which is a, a term broadly used, um, there are all these types of treatments that are available. Uh, the, the one I'm going to talk to you about is, is the chemical peel. 